Hi, and welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. I'm Craig Carroll, member number 1230. Tonight, I have the honor of welcoming my guest, Dr. Michael Bortner, uh, man myth legend, uh, scuba diver, world traveler, and collector of thousand stitch belts and Japanese good luck flags. So t t what, is, uh, what is what I know as a kamikaze flag and you refer to as a Japanese good luck flag? Right. Well, first, let me thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, so it's a real pleasure. Um, Japanese good luck flags were given to Japanese servicemen, soldiers, sailors, and airmen um, during the World War II period. Um, they're primarily from the mid-1930s. Um, and they went through until about 1945, and they were given to the servicemen, <clears throat> excuse me, when they were uh, inducted or drafted, and generally before they went off to war. Um, there was usually a party that was given for those men, um, and at some point during the party, maybe after a lot of sake had been, uh, you know, shared or maybe before, um, a, a Japanese flag, a national flag, was put out on a table somewhere uh, along with ink and a brush, and people were invited to sign their names on the flag um, and to sometimes write slogans or, um, you know, admonishments, exultations, uh, off-color comments sometimes, possibly even uh, put a little artwork on them. So, and these flags were given to the guys before they, uh, as I said, went into the service, so that when they shipped overseas or wherever they were, they would take these flags with them. Quite often they would carry them on their person, and um, they were just a reminder of home, um, something that every time they unfolded them would be there to remind them of all their loved ones at home, um, and primarily about the duty that uh, they were uh, uh, anticipating that they would uh, be upholding uh, for that service. So, and, and typically, how big is one of these flags? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, generally, you'll find them maybe 24 inches high by maybe 32 inches long. There is kind of a general size. They're usually in that range. If you see anything bigger, it's usually uh, you know something different. Um, but there are some large ones. I actually um, have a couple in my collection. One is four feet high by eight feet long, um, and one that's a little bit smaller, but those are, you know, you never see those. Those are quite rare. It, 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 is this something that they like wrapped around their body or they put in their helmet or like where when that when that man was going into battle and he had his all his friends with him on this flag on this good luck flag where did that good luck flag live on yeah them? um it, it kind of depended craig i mean um some of the guys uh, you see pictures as they're getting ready to go off to war sort of a formal picture um they might be standing out in front of a shrine or a temple out in front of their home or uh, an archway or something like that and they'll uh, typically have the flag folded across their chest kind of like a bandolier and uh and then tied in the back so we're a little bit larger and so it would be tougher for us to try it i've actually tried that before uh but the japanese were uh and are typically smaller and so it was a little bit easier for them to do but um so usually the flag uh, they may be taken into battle and worn that way under the shirt um, but many of the uh, American servicemen that I interviewed uh, while I was writing my book, uh, I did ask them that question. You know, when you were um, going along um, following a battle, where would you usually find these flags? And uh, they would generally tell me that they found them folded up in a helmet. And uh, later on, when I began to interview <laughs> Japanese veterans, they said that the uh, flags were folded up and placed in the helmets because the helmets were so damn uncomfortable. They used it for padding. You know, it's funny, like, I, I think of these as kamikaze flags because I think the sort of it's an iconic sort of Pearl Harbor shot of the kamikaze flag pilot wearing it on their forehead, but that's right. not really the case. Yeah, so um, while kamikaze units or, or men who may have been in kamikaze units at the end of the war uh, did create these flags and sign them, so I guess you could call them a kamikaze flag, kamikaze meaning divine wind. Um, generally, they were, they were simply uh, 
gifts given to men going into the service um, that were just going to typically, you know, go off overseas. They didn't need to be a kamikaze. As an interesting aside, though, Craig, um, we've been talking about men, but the Japanese were very proud of their uh, animal warriors as well. So I think people are generally familiar, particularly from uh, the different Desert Storm uh, situations that we've had, and even Vietnam, that the, uh, the guys had, had animals, dogs, and they were called war dogs. And the Japanese were no different. And uh, on very rare occasions, um, I've seen uh, only a handful of flags that were actually presented to a man's war dog. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know that would be a different one as well. But kamikaze, not usually. Uh, unit flags, not usually. Um, that's another thing you normally hear. Well, what is that? Oh, all the guys in the unit sign that flag. That's, that's very rare because uh, generally it would carry information that the uh, command wouldn't want to mm -hmm. be possibly out in the field where if it was taken uh, as a trophy that you know it could give up information on the unit. So they are, they are out there, there are flags, but they were generally presentation pieces um, that hopefully weren't carried into battle. Well, that probably wasn't always the case. Is there a difference between a, a sort of a, a private, I don't know what the Japanese version of a private would be, and an officer's flag, or the, or are they similar? Or like Yeah. Um, for a lot of years, uh, you would hear that, um, the, so the Japanese military was really, um, was really structured in terms of its ranks. And so uh, you don't generally see an officer's flag um, that will have, say, a private signing on it. Um, and on fairly rare occasions, you will see uh, a man of lower rank have an officer or possibly even, say, a general or an admiral signing on his flag, but those are really rare. Um, and the way you generally tell these is sometimes a guy will uh, sign, have signatures on his flag where the people will sign their names and actually put down their rank. So yeah, that's how you know. And you can also tell by those ranks well, this uh, fellow who was presented this flag must have been in the Navy because all the people signing are giving naval ranks, and similar with Army as well. Army now, now, can you read? They're called kanjis, right? Right. Can you read these? I mean, do you have a? a yeah. No. You know, I'm not. I'm not uh, fluent in kanji or in Japanese. Um, I've collected the flags. Uh, for many years, though, ever since I was really a young boy, maybe you know nine years old, um, and I, I uh, began the collection by grouping them visually uh, in, in you know the similarities between the flags, and it wasn't until later when I discovered when I went looking for that book that would be out there to to tell me, an avid collector, you know what I was looking at in terms of these flags, that I realized there there was no book. No one had done the research. Uh, what people knew about the flags at the time were primarily stories or fallacies or, you know, what the guys said, and quite often weren't really true. So what I did was I started out by grouping the flags in my collections, and then in collection, and then quickly um, made very good friends with a number of different Japanese guys who helped. Uh, I would give them information. I would say, can you translate this for me? And they would. And so that's sort of how uh, the collection developed from there and how I began to learn more about them. And fascinating because nothing like that had been done in Japan as well. So let me just back you up for a second because you talked about the separating these and you talked about starting to collect as a young man. And so it's a little unusual that, you know, you have a teenager running around collecting this type of war memorabilia. And I saw in your book that many of these have blood stains and burns and bullet holes and, you know, clearly they're the real deal. So first of all, how young were you and, you know, are you just like a freakazoid that you grew up like wanting these flags or did something trigger you? Right. Well, um, so I was born in the, in the mid fifties and grew up primarily in the sixties and seventies. And at that uh, time, virtually, you know, every kid my age had either a father or an uncle or a grandfather who had fought in the war. So, uh, you know, having World War II veterans around, World War II veterans who uh, would, you know, talk about their adventures basically uh, in war, um, it, it, was, it was very common. And uh, a lot of those men brought back war souvenirs. 
Um, there's an old saying, as a matter of fact, um, I don't know if you've heard it, but, uh, and it's attributed to Winston Churchill, but if you actually look, it's also attributed to Douglas MacArthur and various and sundry presidents and other people too. So, but the saying was, was that the, you know, the British fight for honor and the French fight for glory, but Americans fight for the souvenirs. <laughs> so <laughs> Americans have always through the years traditionally loved the stuff, not just the Americans, but they've liked the stuff. So they brought plenty of it, shipped plenty of it back home. And, um, you know, uh, with a kid talking to, you know, a neighbor or my own father or uncle about this stuff, asking them, you know, can you tell me what you did during the war, sort of Patton-esque, what did you do during the Great War? Um, when they realized that, that I was really interested in this stuff, then stuff just started coming out of foot lockers and duffel bags and that kind of stuff. And they were actually happy to give them to me. And I had friends that was similar, you know, their fathers or uncles or grandfathers gave them things too. So this stuff wasn't, wasn't all that unusual. How I became interested in it was just an offshoot of my interest uh, as a kid, a very young kid in flags, um, which was probably where I first started getting my sort of exploration uh, adventure, you know, inklings going. Um, because I, I was small and didn't travel, but I could read about places and events, and uh, invariably there was either going to be a national flag of some kind or an organizational flag that I thought was really interesting. And so I began to, uh, you know, instead of, uh, I don't know, drawing animals or houses or race cars, I would, you know, draw flags and color them in and stuff like that. So I had flags plastered all over the wall. It was just something that I, I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, that's how I got into it. And where did you grow up? So uh, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in Orange County. Yeah, I was born in the city of Orange. And were any other kids into this, or you? Um, were yeah, you part I of mean, a club or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I again, um, you know, I had friends. Uh, well, everybody had a club back then. When they were little kids, you just invented a club, uh, and then all your buddies would join. Um, but you know, we typically. Um, you know, would would play war. Uh, you know, we heard about all the stuff from uh, from our fathers. Uh, I don't know if, if you recall the uh, million dollar movie. Everybody watched, you know, the million dollar movie, um, you know, flying leather necks and all that kind of stuff. So everybody was, I mean, that was just a thing. And so we would play war. And, you know, when your buddies heard that, you know, it was time to uh, bunch up over at so-and-so's house to play war games. You know, somebody would come around the corner wearing a German helmet that their dad brought back from Italy, or a guy would have a, you know, Japanese flag or something that he would tie on the tree, and that's where his team would, you know, gather up to start. I mean, it was really typical. That's yeah. great. What a neat experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when did the collection, like, you're a serious collector. How many flags do you have? Um, I lost count, Craig. Um, I was I was interviewed by Japanese uh, public television in HK back in uh, the I don't know back in the 2000s, uh, 2010, something like that, and they asked me that question. At the time, I had well over 300 flags, um, and uh, you know that was 10, 15 years ago. So I've got more now. And have you researched each one? Do you know the story of each one for all intents and purposes? Purposes. Um, f for the most part. The research that you can do is is very limited because again, what the flags are is is a national flag. Usually, it'll have a slogan across the top or down the side, um, which is pretty typical. The slogan is usually "Bun Chokyu" or "Ki Bun Chokyu," which means um, you know everlasting battle fortunes or prayers for your everlasting battle fortunes. Um, and then signatures of people, and that's it. So it would be like a great comparison is like uh, opening up a telephone book. You know, if you opened up a telephone book and somebody pointed to a name on there and said, okay, start your research, tell us about all of this other information around that, there wouldn't really be anything you could come up with. So that's why it's key when you see differences in flags to, to understand what those differences are because Yes, those are often able to zero you in on possibly where the owner of the flag, where he had come from, what shrine or temple he may have worshipped at. Um, that's kind of a good place to start, and even that's sort of a, a rarity to find. But yeah, you can really research flags um, based on that. Um, 
but there is information that, that makes the flags interesting. Sometimes you'll see um, lyrics to poems. So for me, you know, I would see writing that looked different. I would say to my friend, please translate that for me. I know it's a poem. He would come back and say, yeah, it's that. And then I would uh, go online, thank goodness for the internet, and I would research the poem. So right away, I would have some really interesting perspective on what that was. If there was a picture or a caricature on the flag, I could look up what that was. Quite often, it ended up being uh, caricatures uh, or characters of well-known Japanese comic strips that meant something. Uh, often, um, the guy who had drawn the character on there was sort of drawing a, a, a pun intended reference to that comic strip to his friend who he was writing that on that friend's flag. So there's all kinds of really yeah, interesting things that way. I noticed some of them have animals, like mostly tigers, as, as I remember. What, what's the significance of that? Yeah, so actually most of them don't have tigers. Um, as far as I know, um, uh, and we can see them on the monitors here, these just happen to be flags um, that have tigers on them that came from from my collection, it took me uh, it took me 55, 56 years to collect 50 flags with tigers on them, and um, I, you know, I've been an avid collector. They just aren't out there. Generally, what you find are uh, simple uh, black on white, um, you know, characters that have been drawn. Sometimes you'll see airplanes drawn on them, so you'll know maybe the guy was a pilot. Um, things like that primarily. When you do see um, a tiger, it's pretty rare. Usually they're done in black and gray. Sometimes they're done in color. And the tiger does have significant meaning uh, for the Japanese and you know, f for the Asian culture as well. So. So tell me about Thousand Stitch Belts, because this is something I knew absolutely nothing about until I read your two books. And just what is the concept of a Thousand Stitch Belt? And did, was there a belt along with every good luck flag, or these are two totally different sort of concepts? Yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of people aren't familiar with Thousand Stitch Belts. They might be more familiar with the flags, um, because in fact, uh, while samurai swords tended to be the number one bring back item, of, uh, of the Allied military, the, the flags really were the number two. So, so uh, guys in the service really uh, that were in the Pacific hoped to bring back a flag, and you know guys that fought over in Europe as well. Um, but um, the Thousand Stitch Belt is an interesting piece. Uh, when a guy would uh, go into the service before he shipped out, he would be given a celebration, and at that celebration, he generally received his good luck flag and a thousand stitch belt, which are known as seninbari in Japanese. Seninbari means 1,000 person stitches. So they generally carried um, a thousand stitches on them unless the person doing the stitching lost track, because a thousand's a pretty big number. Um, but um, so uh, you found them in, in various kinds of items of clothing. You would find seninbari caps. Um, that people would wear on their heads. Uh, you found shirts with thousand stitches, vests with thousand stitches, and, and belts typically would be given with the flag as the guy was being celebrated uh, into the service and then sent overseas. So um, would you like me to explain uh, about the thousand stitch belts? I mean, I'd love to get a, you know, for the audience to get a better understanding of how big they are, how they're tied, what they, what they mean, and like, what if you have like a thousand and one stitches? Sure. Bad luck? Or, yeah, like, yeah exactly, exactly right. And people will generally ask me that. Well, you know, I see that, but how many stitches are there really? And so, you know, early on, I would actually count the rows and then count the stitches. And, you know, generally there's, you know, a thousand. But sometimes what would happen is, is quite often, the stitch belts were made by, by women. Uh, it wasn't the custom for men to place knots or stitches in the belts. They were made uh, by men, women primarily. But sometimes little girls who, uh, who maybe weren't old enough to, uh, to stitch, put a knot in the belt, would be tasked with taking a little stamp and they would sit there and they would dip the stamp in ink and they would make a little circle. And so they would make the thousand circles where the thousand knots would go, and who knows, maybe somewhere between 952 and a thousand, you got 978 or something. You know, that's just. I think the key was that the more stitches or knots that were added to the cloth, 
the greater the protection for the person who was wearing or carrying the item. You just wanted to have it on your body. So some sin and bari uh, are not belts. Uh, they were simple pieces of cloth. And the concept, uh, which is known as guriki kigan, um, which means uh, combined force or power, was that as each knot and each person's well wish or good luck wish was added to that piece of cloth, it imparted more and more strength to that cloth. And it was sort of hoped that when the man uh, carried that or wore that into battle, that it would bring him you know, great luck. Um, and if, uh, if he did suffer uh, in battle, whether he was uh, harmed or whether he was killed, he would at least be able to do his duty as fully as possible as he had been able to do so if he was killed. And that was a question I did ask. Uh, you know, Japanese veterans, you know, did you believe that this thousand stitch article would actually protect you from harm in battle? And often they would sort of, you know, look at me and said, well, it was fairly obvious sometimes that, you know, it didn't. But uh, we still continued to wear these and carry them out of respect um, to the women back home that we loved and who, through their devotion, made and gave this to us. So, um, but the belt was probably the most typical, and they're generally about six inches high, and they vary in length, um, you know, generally uh, maybe 30, 32 uh, inches long. And then we'll, we'll generally have a tie string on either end. So the belt is wrapped around the waist um, as a haramaki um, to protect the vital key area, which the Chinese call it chi, but the Japanese have you know, the similar um, concept. It's called ki. And that's where they believe that, the, uh, that a man's vital life energy uh, is contained. So if you, uh, if you wear a haramaki, a belt around your waist, uh, the warmth that is imparted to your hara, your abdomen, helps keep you healthy. So healthy um, kind of goes along with good luck. And what eventually happened was, was the cloth haramakis, which many Japanese still wear because they, you know, the concept of keeping the abdomen warm, over time, collecting a number of these, I, I began to discover haramaki that had seninbari cloth panels sewn to them. And so you could see the evolution over time of how keeping the abdomen warm, which was supposed to be a, you know, good luck and health, and then the thousand stitch concept being incorporated into that basically was to bring the, the man good luck. As they wore these and they went into battle, often, uh, a man escaped injury or escaped imminent death. And so as those stories accumulated over a period of many, many years uh, in, within the Japanese military, they sort of took on a life of their own. And some people did believe that uh, by wearing that, yeah, they could escape harm in battle. So after the battle, you know, assuming the Japanese lost and the Americans won, would the Americans, like, did they know where to look for these? Would they go right to the bodies and remove them? Or is there a process? Yeah. Um, well, again, I, uh, you know, uh, Ernest Hemingway, I think, said that, uh, you know, man's greatest uh, adventure was war. And so, yeah, there were a, a lot of men uh, from the United States, uh, you know, were in the war during World War II, and they came from small towns, you know, rural areas and farms, primarily big cities, of course, but um, we were primarily a rural uh, nation. And so, um, the guys, you know, go, going over and fighting, whether it was in the Pacific or Europe, was a big deal for men who may never have left home after they got back from that war experience. And so I think even for collectors of material culture, of things like that today, um, they look at that sort of thing and it reminds them of possibly the greatest event that had ever occurred or would ever occur in their lives. So they, you know, uh, they were looking for things like that. And so following a battle, they may pick up a, a Japanese helmet. That was common. They may, you know, find a sword. They would pick that up. Um, but the flags were a huge item. And uh, the thousand stitch belts, yes, but, um, not, you know, not so much as the flag. Again, the flags were often carried in a, in a man's pocket. Um, I asked a, um, a veteran where he got his flag from, and he says, I, 
I took it right out of uh, the soldier's pack. It was folded up in his pack. So it wasn't even on his person. Um, you know, again, others found them inside the helmet's pockets. It, it just didn't matter. They would find them everywhere. When the Japanese uh, surrendered, was there a, a sort of a giving of their of the admiral's flags or anything like that, or they're like, now we're keeping our flags? Yeah, you know, the Japanese during during World War II had no concept of surrender. Um, uh, there was a really interesting book by a uh, an American Marine officer who was an intelligence uh, and uh, an intelligence officer and. Uh, he was on Saipan and a couple of the other islands, and his mission, one of his missions, was to, uh, he mounted a bullhorn on a jeep, and his job was to uh, drive and locate Japanese caves, um, and where, say, snipers or Japanese soldiers were firing at the Americans who were trying to advance. His job was to, and he spoke Japanese, was to broadcast at these caves to try to get as many of these guys to surrender as they could. And um, the stories that he wrote about were interesting because he said, uh, interviewing the Japanese, they had no concept of, of surrender. That really wasn't in their vocabulary. So when he, you know, he would say to the guy, hey, I'm asking you to come out and surrender, it was almost like, you know, what is that? They didn't really know what that meant. It had been so ingrained in their psyche for so many years um, that, you know, surrender was the most dishonorable thing that a, a soldier could do, that a man could do. And they received a great honor in dying in battle. So while their families back home, obviously, like our families, were sad when their uh, loved ones, you know, didn't return, um, as culturally, um, that was a big deal for them. Um, they felt very proud that they had given up a son um, for the emperor. There was a saying, as a matter of fact, that the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen were to give their lives up freely as cherry blossoms flew, uh, fell from the cherry trees at the height of their beauty, you know, signifying these young men, you know, who were in their prime um, would die for the emperor. And there's many stories about these people, like every single man to the final man, you know, fought to the death. I mean, what a concept. Absolutely. And that was the whole reason behind it. So, yeah. Wasn't there some guy that was like, like finally came out of a cave in like the mid 70s that was convinced? That, am, I, am I getting it right? Yeah, no, there was. Um, he died a number of years ago, but you're absolutely right. They finally, uh, they knew he was out there. Um, you know, people's game uh, would come up missing because he was hungry. He would, you know, sneak into somebody's yard and, you know, kill their cow or whatever. Um, but yeah, they were finally able to get him to surrender when they located his uh, commanding officer many, many years, you know, obviously following the war. And they got the commanding officer to carry a bullhorn and go around and essentially tell this man that, hey, it was okay for him to surrender. And he came out and he uh, received a hero's welcome back in Japan and uh, got married and, uh, yeah, just had a marvelous life for the next, whatever it was, 15 or 20 years. 15 minutes of fame. Basically. Hope he got his back pay. <laughs> Hey, um, so let's talk about respect because it, you know it's something we, we spoke about which really surprised me was because uh, I had asked you you know is there a big museum for this in Japan is there a sort of a war memorial and maybe you can share with me why this is not you know a favorite topic among the Japanese right yeah so um, the the war memorial for Japan is located in Tokyo and it's known as Yasukuni Shrine um, and it's a, a Shinto shrine Shinto was. Uh, uh, a religion that was intimately tied to uh, Japan and the military. It was recognized as the state religion and, and became the state religion, uh, while many Japanese are also Buddhist. Um, but um, during the war, the artifacts that the guys took, the good luck flags, the stitch belts, and, and those kinds of things were proudly given to them as they uh, were sent off into battle. Uh, when they came back, uh, if they came back, uh, it, it wasn't a good thing. Uh, following the war, the country was in ruins, um, and uh, the people were, were very uh, in very bad condition. The economy was a shambles, and people were starving. So uh, there was nothing at that point for the general populace to be proud of. They, uh, they had lost the war. And, uh, and 
uh, they were shamed by that based upon their cultural outlook. Um, added to that, the Americans were, uh, they had the Army of Occupation in Japan, um, so Douglas MacArthur and his troops were um, just literally um, confused by the whole Japanese concept of doing war. So we're talking about kamikaze pilots, uh, you know, crashing airplanes into American ships and that kind of thing. The, uh, the Americans were literally afraid of that. And so one of the things that uh, MacArthur sat about doing was to essentially remake the Japanese culture from a military one into a more pacifist one. And he was successful at doing that. So, um, you know, the Japanese veterans or families that had these uh, relics uh, either packed them away or were no longer proud of them and valued them, sold them or threw them away. Many, many things uh, were thrown into the trash um, because they were ashamed. And um, so they don't have a greatest generation. They just have a generation um, that in many respects uh, was devalued because of what they did to the nation by the current generation of people. They still had people who were very nationalistic and who did admire those things. But for the most part, uh, you know, beginning in 1946 onward, the, uh, the American Army of Occupation set about pacifying literally the Japanese population. And they went from having the ability to have an offensive army to now only having with a few changes more recently, a defensive one. So the Japanese are really not pro-war anymore. They don't want to see what happened during World War II ever happen to Japan again. So when you were getting these translated, I assume that some of the people that were able to translate it were also ex-military from Japan? Or, I mean, like, what did they think about this, you know, spry young lad in Orange <laughs> County that was collecting these flags? Right. Yeah, so... Um, it's, that's an interesting question because um, I had a neighbor who was a, uh, a Japanese, he was a Japanese man and he uh, was a Japanese language teacher at the, uh, the local university near where I lived. And when I um, found my first flag, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was bring it to him and have him look at it um, and let me know, you know what it said and tell me all about it. So. Uh, what I found out was he could, he could read it, but he couldn't tell me all about it. He really didn't know anything about it. And that ended up being a theme that carried over until I was finally able to you know, do the research and, and write the books that I wrote. Now it's, it's pretty common for anybody that wants to know about these. Oh yeah, everybody knows that. Well, 20 years ago, nobody knew any of that, you know, and before. Um, but he, wasn't, he was not real excited to be looking at this flag, which, um, literally had, uh, you know, blood stains and holes in it. It had been brought back to the United States by an American serviceman, obviously. Um, and I had found it at a, uh, at a, um, an old gun show, military show uh, in Southern California. This is your first flag, right? Yeah, this was my first flag. So what kicked flag. it all off. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually um, maybe about nine years old, uh, maybe 10, something like that. And I went to a gun show with my dad. My dad was an outdoorsman, and he wanted to look at some rifles, and, and he asked me if I wanted to go with him. And I said, sure. Um, you know, I loved hanging out with my dad. So uh, we went to this show. And I had seen a picture of a Japanese good luck flag, maybe when I was about eight years old. Uh, I was doing some research on flags uh, as a Cub Scout, so I was really pretty young. And I saw a Japanese good luck flag, so I kind of sort of knew what they looked like, but I didn't know much about them. Um, and as we were walking along the aisles of this show, I happened to look over and kind of hanging out of a paper bag was something. And I, as soon as I saw it, I went, I wonder. And my dad continued on walking down the aisle, and I stopped, and I said to the man behind the, the uh, booth, I says, hey, listen, is that for sale? Or, is that for sale? <laughs> However I said it when I was nine. <laughs> and uh, he said, sure, and he, go, and he stopped, and he turned around, and he looked at me again, and he says, you know, son, that ain't no John Wayne movie prop. And I went. Just like that. Just like that. And I went. <laughs> Wow. And, uh, you know, for a kid growing up in the 60s, that had massive impact because yeah. I think, as I told you, we all 
everybody knew that John Wayne had won World War II single-handedly. I mean, <laughs> he'd, he'd been to Iwo Jima, he, you know, he'd, he'd flown P-40s, he'd done, a, you know, commanded, you know, U-boat or submarines, not U-boats, but... Uh, so, so that was a, a big statement, and so I said, can I see it? And he took it out of the bag and he shook it out, and I, I knew right away what it was, and so by that point, my dad walked up and he says, what have you found? And I said, this is one of those flags I told you about. And he said, oh, okay, so it is. And uh, I said, can I buy it? And he said, do you have enough money? And I went, I don't know. So I looked at the man again, and I said, how much is it? And he said, it's $20. And so again, this would have been like 1966 or something like that. A lot that. of money for a nine-year-old kid. Yeah, I mean, I think it took every penny I had from mowing lawns, you know, to, to uh, cobble it together, and I gave it to him. And so that ended up being, being my first flag, yeah, absolutely. But, um, so, so that was the flag I showed these, these uh, professors, and uh, you know, they were not real excited about it, understandably, I, I suppose, but um, later on I met a man in Japan who had been um, an army fighter pilot for the Japanese. He'd been educated in Canada before the war, had attended their uh, sort of version of West Point, and um, he was over in Japan working for U.S. intelligence uh, post-war. And um, so a friend of mine introduced me to him, and uh, so I wrote him, and I said, would you mind looking at some of these uh, pictures for me and giving me input? Because I had a lot of questions, and there weren't a lot of Japanese veterans living in Southern California at that time. So, um, and so he was very free with his, his answers, and um, even, even the flags or the 1,000 stitch belts, the ones that I would take pictures of and send him, didn't matter what kind of damage they had on them or anything. He, uh, he was more than willing to, to look at them and uh, share his expertise on those with me. And uh, until finally one day, you know, I thought this must really be, I'm thinking, you know, about the reaction I got from the professor. This must really be tough on him, you know, looking at these. Um, and so I, I wrote him and I said, listen, if you really don't want me sending you these things anymore, I'd, I'm fine with that, you know, so if it's okay, you know, let me know. If it's not, please let me know that as well. And he wrote back and he said, uh, he's the one that basically said, you know, we're not the greatest generation here in Japan. We're the ones uh, that brought ruin on the country back in the 40s. And so if these flags or senimbari are receiving the proper attention and respect by a young American, then he says, I, I don't think I can ask for more and I'm more than happy to help, help you with whatever you need. And he was, he's, he's passed away now, but uh, he helped me for many years uh, with any questions that I had. So. Super guy. So what's the derivation of this concept of, of this good luck flag? I mean, it didn't just appear one day. Is, is there a, a history for yeah. hundreds of years or tens of years or what's the history? There, there really doesn't seem to be. Most of the good luck flags came from the period of the Great East Asia War. That's what uh, the Japan, Japanese call the military conflicts that they fight. So World War II for the Japanese. We call it World War II started with the bombing at Pearl Harbor in 1941. So World War II for us, 41 to 45. But the Japanese had the Great East Asia War, which began in the early 30s, but really took hold in the mid 30s um, with the Marco Polo uh, Bridge incident to China, uh, Manchuria, Korea, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, what was the question, though? Well, I was just talking, I was curious about the history, like, you know, yeah. how did it start? Like, yeah. I imagine it probably started, you know, 100 years earlier, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, so it appears through the material culture, through the items that we have, that probably 99.9% .9 of the flags were all created for that period of about the mid-1930s through 1945. But I do have a flag that dates back to uh, the first Sino-Japanese War and uh, the Russo-Japanese War. So it dates back to the late 1890s. It goes through to uh, 1904, 1905, and there it ends. And the way I know it, which goes back to one of your earlier questions, you know, how do you really research these things? What can you tell? The artwork that's on the flag and the patriotic slogans that are written on the flag 
were indicative of those particular wars. So nobody during World War II would have made reference back to the first Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War and then ended it right there. This person, uh, it was apparent, carried the war, uh, the flag in both wars. So it was his, his flag, he was in the service and served through both wars. You know, always the And that's very uncommon, I'm sorry. That's the oldest flag I'm even aware that, it, that exists. If someone has any older, they've never no notified me. That's the cornerstone of your collection. Yeah, yeah, that's where it all starts. And so what will you do, like one day, not to be inappropriate, we're all gonna die, you too. What's gonna happen to your collection? Is there a plan? I mean, it's a pretty amazing collection. Yeah. Um, well, since that day, we'll... I hope it's a long time. Hope, Let me thank just... you. Be hopefully so far off. I, I really haven't given it a ton of thought. When I was in Japan, um, I met with the director of the, uh, the Showa era, the World War II era museum there, and um, he, was, he was hoping that I would take a spin over to the Yasukuni Shrine and talk to them about possibly uh, having my collection go over there. But... Um, yeah, I've never, I've never really decided what would happen to it. So whether it would go to my children or what would happen. Have you it. ever uh, put it, on, put it on a show across America? I mean, it just seems like a pretty relevant, fascinating piece of history that yeah. I have no familiarity with until I came here to this club, and obviously we have one, which is how we met. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's neat. Um, the the pictures that are being shown uh, right now that show tigers, um, I actually wrote a book that came out last year, and it's all on those tiger flags. So it's on the artwork. So um, the a lot of the, the artwork, the tiger artwork that are on these flags seem to be uh, extremely similar to Japanese ukiyo-e or woodblock prints uh, that were done of tigers you know, 100, 200, 300, maybe more years ago. So somebody obviously was comparing the pictures of the tigers that, you know, they discovered on woodblock prints and, you know, copying it. There's a classic example right there right now of a woodblock print and then one that was found on a good luck flag, the black and white right there. I mean, they're almost identical. So that would make a, a terrific, I think, art exhibit for any art historian or somebody who's really uh, knowledgeable, uh, an academic in, in the field of, uh, you know, woodblock prints and that kind of thing. That has not been done and uh, it would be a neat one. But there have been uh, exhibits. There was, uh, when I was living in Florida, there was a textile art center, one of the few ones in the country, uh, that put on a 5,000 square foot exhibit of uh, Japanese off to war banners, good luck flags, and a thousand stitch belts from my collection. And it was amazing. It was, uh, it was open for, I think, about three or four months and uh, received wide attendance. Yeah, it was neat. You know, my last question is that uh, I often will look at it's sort of uh, letters written by soldiers over the years, whether it's the Civil War, or World War I, or World War II, and you can just get so much insight into society and what was important to them back then and the way they referred to each other. And I'm curious, are there any other sort of I don't know if it would be sociological uh, implications from these flags. Do you get a good understanding of what was going on? What was the popular music at that time? Because you mentioned that they would often write uh, lyrics from a mm -hmm. song. So did do you sort of, are you able to take away like kind of what Japanese youth culture was like back then from what's on the flags at all? Um, yeah, you know, that's interesting. I, I big data, as we like to say in the <laughs> technology, is there any big data takeaway here? I, I think, you know, I think we all pretty much understand <laughs> that there's, uh, the propaganda is pretty limited today. We don't get a lot of propaganda, but uh, back then, everything was basically propaganda. And the Japanese had a really interesting concept because they enjoyed propaganda. Because in the Japanese mind, whatever it was, they were being told, true or not true, if it helped uh, with the war effort in any way, then it wasn't a bad thing, whether it was uh, outright truth or out, outright fallacy, you know, it was good. So, um, so you would see in 1940 fla 1945, you know, things written on a Japanese flag, encouraging the guy, you know, to go out there still and do his best and, uh, and that kind of thing um, as well. There, there is a flag that I have in my collection. I think it's one of the ones that, that we have up here. Um, and I don't know, Phoebe, if, if you can find it, it's the one that had the large tiger head that was on the side and I had you stand it up. Um, and 
so we have a, a single picture of the tiger head, and we also have a picture of the flag itself that has a big round red seal on it. It's quite large, if, if you can find that, great, if not. Um, and that flag was actually presented by a man uh, who did serve in a, a TOCO unit. So he was uh, in school, if you will. He was in a Yokerin or Yokerin unit to be a kamikaze, and he was gonna be a naval pilot, and that was what he was gonna do. And um, there were lyrics uh, written on that flag for, uh, at the time, what was known as the Japanese Second National Anthem. Uh, and that was a song that was sung and listened to by many Japanese. Uh, it was quite poignant, uh, especially at the end of the war, as they knew, uh, you know, that the war was coming to an end. Um, but the kamikaze would often sing this song before they went on their final mission. Um, what's interesting about it to me is that representation of what that song meant at that particular time. I have a friend whose mother is, uh, I think she's 94 years old and lives in Japan, they're Japanese. And uh, he told his mother that whenever uh, she heard that song, it just gave her goosebumps. And then there was sort of a pause, and she said, but not in a good way. So it just depended, you know. I assume you've, you've traveled back to Japan. I have. So where have you been in Japan? And I mean, you must be sort of a, a bit of an oddity, a hero, a villain to certain groups over there. I mean, all of the above? Actually, not, not really so much. Um, you know, Western people still sort of stand out, you know, because our hair is not black and we're tall, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I've, I've traveled all, all over Japan. I've toured, uh, you know, Tokyo. I've been through the, uh, uh, many of the different uh, museums, the different areas museums all over Tokyo. I've, uh, you know, traveled uh, past where the Japanese Instrument of Surrender was signed. Um, I've been to Kamakura, where the great Buddha uh, is, and uh, that's a beautiful uh, area. Um, and it's also an area where many of the uh, Japanese uh, military people, before they shipped off, would go and sort of pay their last religious respects. Um, so yeah, I've been all over Japan. It's, uh, it's a terrific place. I've only been uh, to Tokyo once, but what a fun place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you feel is really important for our audience to understand about uh, your collection, you know, what drives you? Yeah. You, want to share? you know, the only thing I might mention is, um, and I think it's, it's particularly relevant for the Adventures Club, because um, when you do an adventure and you've, you actually have the honor of being presented a flag that you can carry into the field on your particular adventure, um, that flag usually comes back signed. And it's, it's, uh, it's symbolic. That flag carries with it, um, you know, it carries with it, honestly, the hopes, the dreams, the history, uh, everything that's wrapped up in the Adventures Club for the last hundred plus years, uh, people are, are proud to, to carry that flag and they're proud to, to succeed and, and carefully bring it home and they sign it. And, um, and it, it was the same with the Japanese. They would, uh, they would take this flag, it meant everything to them, uh, it symbolized everything that they had grown up with. I'm sure you're familiar with us as Americans, you know, when we would talk about the flag, we would hear about mom and apple pie. When you say that today, it might not mean so much much to the younger generations, but, you know, to somebody like me, you or me, what did mom and apple pie mean? It meant, you know, America, and we know what that means. And that was the same with the Japanese, too. And everybody who carried, cared about that person who was going on that adventure, that military adventure, would sign it. And so it, it was quite similar, it has quite similar, uh, uh, you know, an aspect to me. And as you know, we have the Adventures Club flag, which uh, if we're lucky enough, someday we can take to the top of a mountain. But it's very special to take an ACLA flag to a remote place and, and uh, memorialize it with a photo. Well, you ask me, and I hope, hopefully I'll be able to go with you sometime. And so, you know, you're a, new, a newbie to the Adventures Club, and so what's your take? Uh, you know, you just walked in here one day a few months ago after watching our YouTube, which I loved and knew everything about the flag, which was even better, right. our flag. Uh, so what's your take? How would you describe the Adventures Club to our audience? Absolutely. Well, let me tell you first, the Adventures Club flag, if you happen to notice, the old flag, about two-thirds 
of it is a Japanese flag. It's a white background, you know, with a rising sun. Uh, so that caught my eye right off the bat. I looked at that. Um, the logo's changed a little bit since then, but um, so anyway, I'm sorry. So the Adventures Club is, uh, it's, it's an amazing place uh, for me. Uh, adventuring, um, exploring has been a part of my life ever since I was a little kid when all I could do was read about it, um, and, you know, in books or uh, watch it on TV or whatever. But, um, you know, when I had the opportunity to finally begin doing some things, um, you know, there's a certain passion, a, a certain spirit among people who find, uh, you know, who have that adventuresome spirit, who want to do those sorts of things. Um, and, but as my wife says, you know, she thought that I was the only crazy person that wanted to do stuff like that. Uh, and I, I quite by accident came across uh, a YouTube video um, of an Adventures Club program. And uh, with the open invitation new, I had to come and visit, which I did. And. Uh, I'm not the only individual like this. Apparently, You're there's friends. There's a whole club of people like this. So, and for our YouTube audience, I hope you will take Michael's advice and come visit us and uh, experience the club for yourself and Absolutely. see our Japanese good luck flag. Absolutely. I think we'd like to uh, open it up to some questions, if that's okay. Anybody have any questions? That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. That was just amazing and. Your collection is quite remarkable, and and just what a great tribute! And thanks, thanks for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm I'm curious to know if this is unique to Japan, or if other countries did anything like this. A lot of countries were part of you know some great wars, and and a lot of you know brave young people served, and, and it's, it seems like a great honor to have a flag. Is it? Are there other countries that did this too? Yeah. Uh, most of the research I've done has focused uh, on the Japanese flags, um, but there has been some, you know, tangential sort of um, other flags that have come across sort of my desk, but only on a limited basis. Um, I've seen uh, signed uh, Manchurian flags, signed uh, Republic of China flags, all old, old flags. Um, and I haven't really gone beyond that. I just haven't really seen it. It's possible more so today. Um, it, it is um, countries that are involved in wars, when they capture an enemy flag, are known to sign it themselves as a, uh, as a battle trophy. But in terms of other nations doing what the Japanese did, I'm, I'm really not aware of that. So. Other questions, Chuck? Yeah. So, first of all, how do you uh, display these things? How do you keep them? How do you keep them from deteriorating and, and you know not getting, getting eaten by moths or whatever? Do right. you have them uh, hanging? What? Uh... Right. So the flags are generally uh, made out of three types of materials. They're either uh, silk flags, um, cotton flags, or rayon. Rayon was actually most people don't realize uh, rayon or artificial silk uh, existed well before World War II. Um, and so the issues that you have with them are often either due to moisture or uh, humidity. So uh, what I've tried to do is store the flags. It's always best to store them flat uh, in between acid-free paper. Um, and the easiest way to do that, I have found, is to uh, get an old architect's blueprint cabinet. And uh, they're usually quite deep. They're quite wide, and uh, they make a great a great storage place for the flags. And then, of course, you keep them away from any direct heating vents, any direct air conditioning vents away from the windows. And you know, people will ask me, "Yeah, but what about what about hanging them?" And uh, the answer is is uh, yeah, not so much a good idea. Um, but I have some that are favorites of mine, and they'll actually go up on the wall, because literally every day I want to look at them. I have a passion for this, and uh, it's not a good day unless I can walk into my office and see some of these hanging on the wall. So with that caveat, yeah. Unfortunately, the guy who had the flag didn't have such a good day. He did not have a good day, generally. It was not a good luck flag for him, It probably. was not, not good luck. 
Any other questions? Do we have any yeah, uh, audience? Here, here yeah. Well, Mike. you mentioned a few times kamikazes, and to me that's fascinating that young men would sacrifice that life. Was that voluntarily, or did they know? How did family do it? I know they give their hair and some nails, and that's it, kid. Close the, they close the, that uh, airplane and goes down and kill themselves. Did you meet any kamikaze? Did they, all they die or, or like they, some of them survive or do yeah. what you know about that? So that's, yeah, that's a number of questions. Um, I, I never met someone who was a kamikaze. I'm trying to think I, I haven't. Um, but there, there are plenty of stories out there of people who were in kamikaze units or in what was known as homeland defense units. So at the end of the war, as the Allies were pushing in on the Japanese, um, they formed home defense units. Uh, most of their well-experienced uh, pilots were gone. Um, they were flying, you know, people who had very little flight training, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so there was sort of a blurring between the home defense and, uh, and the kamikaze. Um, let's see, and what else did you want to know? I'm sorry, you asked a couple of things. Did they willingly do it, or they like recruited them? Did they recruit them, or willingly, or how did parents yeah. uh, talk about it? Was it an honorable thing to get kids to die, or yeah. yeah, absolutely, because the key was, you know, they were hoping to take out a Japanese or an American battleship or some kind of a major uh, American ship. Um, they weren't terribly successful at it, but they were successful enough to the point where the American uh, shipboard gunners. Uh, we're getting PTSD. Uh, much of it was kept out of the news about how serious it was, but so they put a lot of stress on on the American crews on board the ships. Um, were they pleased to do it? All they cared about really was doing their duty. And I know I had spoken with uh, one other member here earlier. Um, they did, they did do it when they saw other people that they knew in their unit stepping forward to do it. So, uh, you know, we had the concept of, of you know, we're going to do it because we're going to go in with our, our friend and uh, we're going to watch his back just like he's going to watch ours. But for the Japanese, when they would see their friends uh, volunteer to go into that or found themselves in this, say, home defense unit that was now going to be a kamikaze unit, it was part of, of their duty. So, uh, you know, they may be seeing their friends stepping forward. That mattered or didn't matter. What they knew was, was as the, part of their duty, they were going to do whatever it took, even if they were going to, you know, not return. And sometimes they took off to go do it, and they did return. Uh, if there were problems with their airplane, they could they could come on back, you know. Um, I think so, I'd make sure there was a problem with my airplane. Well, you know, and there are actually stories of people who returned multiple times to the point where people are going, you know, come on, you know, this is your sixth time of having, you know, uh, engine problems. Uh, you know, we got we, we need to have the talk. So yeah, the talk, the kamikaze talk. Yeah. Where did you find most of your flags from? From swap meets or advertising or? Yeah, so uh, so it was interesting. I had an uncle who, uh, when he uh, who had fought over in the Pacific, um, he said to me, "Wow, I didn't know you collected those things um, here, you know." And he gave me his. Uh, so I got those. I got them from swap meets. I got them from uh, garage sales. You know, found them early on in flea markets, and then of course when the uh, the internet came along, and then uh, you know they became more prolific on there. What does it cost to buy a flag? Like, if I wanted to buy a middle of the road value flag, like, yeah. I, is it hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? You know, if it has some kind of provenance, so you know, if if not just a story, because everybody's heard a story before, but if it has some kind of verifiable provenance or signature on it or something like that, that could could dictate sort of the value. But a standard flag, you don't know, you know, where it came from or anything, is probably going to be anywhere, and it's in good condition, um, it's probably going to be anywhere from about, say, 250 to maybe 400, 450. A flag like the ones that we've been scrolling here, those would be in the thousands of dollars. So. It just doesn't seem commensurate with the sacrifice on any level. It <laughs> seems pathetically cheap, so. There you go. Never. Any other questions before we as they here? As they get rarer, and they are, I'm sure the prices will continue to rise. How many uh, flags do you have? 
Hold uh, the mic. We gotta, you got to use the mic so that people at home. Here, go ahead. Ask your question. Oh, I um, was wondering, you mentioned that some of them have cartoons on them. Are they mostly all serious, or did you see any with, like, in-jokes from friends before going off? A absolutely. There's, uh, there's plenty of inside jokes. Um, I, actually, <laughs> I actually have a flag that, was, uh, that has a number of cartoons drawn on it. And this is another flag that you can tell by the cartoons and the comments, probably the time frame, like 1938, 1939, and where it came from, because there are many references to China. And, and one of the comments that the person wrote on this, this flag was, uh, I hope when you return, you'll be able to fill us with lots of stories about how you bedded Madam Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> so, you know. Michael, it's a family show. Okay. <laughs> there's, kind of, there's sometimes things like that. Well, uh, my question is, how many flags do you have, and what is your very favorite like flag, and why? Yeah. So I, I've got many flags now, and I don't really have one favorite. If I had to point to any of the favorites, they would be the ones that, uh, that have been scrolling by, probably with the tigers painted on them. I have a few that have dragons painted on them. Those are very rare, and uh, I enjoy those as well, um, especially one from a friend of mine uh, who, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago. He gave it to me before he died, and that means a lot to me. So how many? Dozens or I, I have many hundreds. Many hundreds. Yeah. Well, Michael, I really appreciate it. This has been an honor, and thank you for bringing all the flags for our members to look at and, and, and sharing this little bit of important history with us. And I hope to see you back uh, every Thursday night for uh, until we both depart on the great adventure. Terrific. I, I look forward to it. Thanks.